Uh, I'd like to introduce the next set of uh, speakers. Um, we're a very talented young men. Our first one for this session is Dr. James Lee. He just recently got engaged, so we want to congratulate him. Finally. It's a miracle. <laughs> he did his studies, his uh, doctor studies at Notre Dame. The other school across the border. Uh, and he specializes in early church history, especially Augustine. And he has an interesting uh, perspective of uh, Augustine's um, view of eternal life and how the Korean contribution can be made to that in today's talk. He currently teaches at uh, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and he's been uh, Awarded many awards, as you can see in uh, your video with him as well. Our second speaker, Andrew Kim, uh, could not be with us here today. He tried. He was coming from the shortest distance from Akron. And last night when he got on the plane, they had to turn back because there was a problem with the landing gear. And then eventually they canceled the flight. He went out this morning and said for the 7 a.m. flight, was on standby, and didn't get on. So uh, we will have um, a reader in this place. This is Francis Kim. He's, he's co-editing the uh, volume that will be published with me as well. So he will be reading it. And his English might be a little strange, but it will be okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's from England. That's right. uh, but Andrew Kim is also a young, talented uh, scholar as well, and he specializes in the uh, scholastic period, especially with Thomas Aquinas, and how he can be a guide for the Korean American. Please uh, do a warm uh, welcome for Dr. Richard. Before I begin, I'd like to make some preparatory remarks about my paper as it pertains to Korean American Catholicism. After all, this is a conference on Korean American Catholicism, and yet I find myself here as a patristic theologian in front of you. And by patristic, I mean uh, the study of the early church fathers, uh, the Latin. Pater and his father, and so we have patristic studies. So we've at least learned one thing from me today. <laughs> but what does the early church have to say about Korean American Catholicism? And what does it have to say about the church today? Well, I think that it has much to offer, not in the least in terms of reflection upon our identity and how to preserve diversity in the midst of a pluralistic society. In our previous conversation, we talked about the temptation to turn inward. And I think that uh, what we find in the early church is a unity that's predicated upon diversity. That is to say that diversity is not an end in and of itself, but it has a greater aim of unity. And also that that unity is preserved not at, at the expense of diversity, but as a consequence of it. So what I've done today is I've taken a theme from the early church, the doctrine of the resurrection of the body, and I've tried to show how this teaching can give us an example of unity amidst diversity. On August 16th, 2014, Pope Francis beatified the Korean Catholic martyrs Paul Young Lee Chung and 123 companions. At the beatification mass, Pope Francis declared, quote, not only has Christ risen from the dead and ascended to heaven, but he has united us to himself and grants us a share in his eternal life. Christ is victorious and his victory is ours. Today we celebrate this victory in Paul Young Ji Chang and his 123 companions. All of them lived and died for Christ, and now they reign with him in joy and in glory. The Korean martyrs offer a witness, in Greek, martyria, to Christ's victory over death, and they share in the glory of eternal life. Yet, what is the nature of, e of the eternal life given by Christ? Further, what is the distinctive contribution of Korean Catholicism to a Catholic understanding of heaven and eternal life, if any? This study explores Catholic views of eternal life in the Western Catholic tradition and in Korean Catholicism as it developed in the 18th and 19th centuries. In doing so, it seeks to identify what is common to these traditions and what remains distinctive. 
It concludes by considering the significance of Catholic teaching on eternal life for Korean American Catholic identity. I begin by examining the thought of perhaps the most influential Western theologian in the history of Christianity, Augustine of Hippo, who lived from 354 to 430. Augustine provides the foundation for Western Catholic reflection upon eternal life. Yet much of the richness of his thought, especially on the resurrection of the body, has been neglected. I offer a renewed look at Augustine's teaching on eternal life by exploring works such as De Doctrina Christiana, De Catechizandus Rudibus, and The City of God, with a focus on bodily resurrection. Next, I turn to Korean Catholic views of heaven and eternal life among the Korean martyrs, particularly Augustine Chong Yak Chong, who lived from 1761 to 1801, who was among those beatified by Pope Francis in August 2014. Augustine Chong compiled the first Korean Catechism, a work that was highly influential in the growth of Catholicism in Korea, and which provides insights into distinctively Korean views of eternal life, including an emphasis on heaven as a place of family reunion. I argue that this emphasis upon familial reunion represents an authentic development of the Catholic tradition. Finally, I will consider how to appropriate such traditions in a contemporary context, and how such an appropriation bears meaning for Korean American Catholic identity. On the one hand, Korean American Catholics share the received tradition of the universal church. Catholic, after all, means universal. In Greek, we find it as early as Ignatius of Antioch, around the year 116. While on the other hand, they have the opportunity to carry forward the distinctive tradition of the Korean martyrs, who offer a witness of hope in the joy and glory of eternal life. <coughs> Augustine of Hippo. Augustine's thought on eternal life has been the most influential in the history of the Western tradition. Brian Daly observes that Augustine's teaching is in most of its details thoroughly traditional, based on the accumulated theological resources of the Eastern Church since origin and the Western Church since Tertullian and Hippolytus, as well as on the practices and the cherished hopes of African Christians in his own day. Augustine's theology was forged in the context of the North African tradition of martyrdom. He often celebrated the Eucharistic liturgy and preached in commemoration of the martyrs on feast days, and his works give witness to North African knowledge of the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas, among others. For Augustine, the Church is primarily a communal social body, the one body of Christ with many members. The lives of the martyrs serve as a pledge of the glory to be revealed for the whole church as members of the one body of Christ. The unique sacrifices of the martyrs testify to the unity of the church in the midst of diverse forms of persecution and suffering. Further, their acts of, sacrifice, of sacrifice stand in opposition to the pagan sacrifices of the Roman Empire, and thereby they offer a kind of resistance to the imperial regime. Thus, the witness of the martyrs impacted Augustine's theology, not only in terms of his writings on the unity and the nature of the Church against sectarian groups such as the Donatists, but also in his developing argument against the pagans and works such as the City of God. For Augustine, eternal life consists of the vision of God, the visio dei. Yet, as he makes clear De Doctrina Christiana, this vision is a shared communal vision. The vision of God is a communal sharing in the light and life of the Trinity. For, quote, the light of truth reveals God as Trinitas, who provides for all the things he has made as author and maker of the universe, end quote. The final end of human beings is the enjoyment of God. For enjoyment consists in clinging to something lovingly for its own sake. And a thing is to be loved for its own sake if it constitutes the life of bliss. For Augustine, God alone constitutes the life of bliss. Yet, as Augustine argues, the enjoyment of God is not a solitary act. Instead, quote, the supreme reward is that we should enjoy God and that all of us who enjoy him should also enjoy one another in him, end quote. Thus, the final end of humanity is a shared enjoyment of God, rather than a kind of isolated vision. The shared enjoyment of God is made possible by the one mediator between God and humanity, Jesus Christ, who is the way to the Father. Christ unites the distinctive members of his body in charity. For, quote, while his body consists of many parts, having different functions, 
he binds it tightly together with a knot of unity and love, as its proper kind of health. And as the one mediator, Jesus leads the members of his body to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Just as the Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son, so too the Spirit is the love shared between the members of the Church. The Spirit binds and glues together at Harissa, the members, so that they may remain in the supreme and unchangeable good. And thus Augustine says in one of his famous sermons on the Psalms, that the Holy Spirit is the glue that binds the Church. The Church's members remain unique, yet together they form a fellowship, united in the love of God. During this time, the Church remains on pilgrimage on earth, until all of her members reach the heavenly homeland. At the end of earthly life, the souls of the dead are immediately judged, and either come to share in the vision of God, or receive the just punishment due to the wicked. However, the rewards and punishments experienced by the dead are only a hint of their final destinies, which will be realized at the general resurrection of the body. This is the eschaton, which literally means the end time, when Christ will come in glory, and all the dead will be raised, either to everlasting joy or to eternal damnation. Far from a fearful expectation, the resurrection of the dead is the hope of Christians. For if the dead do not rise again, there is no hope of a future life for us. But if the dead do rise again, there will indeed be a future life. I like to remind, um, when I teach catechesis in my parish, I like to remind my 7th and 8th graders that the church professes every single week that we will rise again bodily that there will be a bodily resurrection. So what you do with your body does in fact matter. Often we forget that. Um, we tend to think of Catholicism as a sort of pie in the sky religion. But it truly is not. It's a, re it's a religion based on the transformation of creation. For Augustine, bodily resurrection means the restoration of the same bodies in which we labor on earth. As he declares in De Catechizandus Rudicus, quote, at the time God wishes, he will restore all things without any delay or any difficulty. Thus human beings will come to render an account of their deeds in the same bodies in which they perform them. And in these bodies they will receive what they deserve. End quote. God is the creator of both souls and bodies, and God will be the restorer of both. The visible flesh will rise again. Yet, following Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, Augustine maintains that the risen body will be a spiritual body, one that is no longer corruptible, and no longer wars against the spirit, but is perfectly subject to the human will, and thus experiences a kind of integration between body and soul. There will be a perfect integration, such that souls will be perfectly content in physical bodies. So for Augustine, there will be a physical aspect or dimension to the resurrected body, but the body will also be spiritual. Augustine goes on to speculate about the nature of the resurrected body in order to deal with objections raised by opponents of Christianity. The resurrection will be a reassembling of all the particles of matter that originally belonged to the individual, yet reshaped according to harmony and proportion. Parts of the body that have been discarded, such as nails and hair, will not necessarily be reclaimed in the same form, nor will be disfigurements of size and shape, so you don't have to worry about clipping your nails or getting your hair cut. <laughs> Further, those who have died as infants or small children will receive additional matter in order to rise in the size they would have been had they reached the age of maturity, which Augustine, interestingly enough, speculates as the age of 33, after the time of Christ. I call that the CNN resurrection of the body, because everyone on CNN is, looks like they're between the ages of 30 and 35. <laughs> so, that would speak with the resurrection of the body. <laughs> Moreover, Resurrected bodies will be in a transfigured state, as evident in City of God 22. So it's not simply a return to bodies in this state, it's, it's a transfiguration, a glorification. Augustine suggests that the bodies of the martyrs will bear the wounds which they suffer for Christ's name. Yet, quote, in their case, these will not be marks of deformity, but marks of honor, end quote. Just as Christ bears the marks of his passion and death in his resurrected body in glorified form, so too the members of Christ's body, that is the church, will bear the marks of their suffering in a glorified way. 
The sufferings of each member are unique, born from the Church's pilgrimage in history, and the Church's journey leads to the resurrection of the whole Christ, the Totus Christus, as a transfigured, glorified body. So what this means is that we will bear in our bodies, in some visible way, the sufferings that we endured for the glory of God. Uh, a student that I taught, she was a, she was a mother of four children, and she said that this made her reflect on the stretch marks that she had after she gave birth to her children. And she said, although in our culture it's not very um, pleasing or aesthetically pleasing to have stretch marks, she said that she wished, she wished that at the resurrection of the body, she would actually bear those stretch marks in some way because they reveal the love that she had for bearing her children. And I think that in some way it's a nice reflection on how the wounds that we endure in this life will be born from. While Augustine's reflections on the nature of the resurrected body remain speculative, two considerations in particular stand out. First, Augustine claims that all of the organs of the body will be restored in ideal form, even though many will not be used, so you will have all your organs at the resurrection. This includes the sexual organs, and the sexual identity of men and women will be retained as a sign of unity and solidarity for which human beings were created. This is a fascinating aspect of Augustine's thought, because the fact that human beings retain their sexuality reveals how humanity is uniquely social and communal by nature, not merely in an external fashion, such as the way birds form flocks, but rather insofar as human beings are created in order to become a member of a fellowship, a societas, and thus to enter into unity with others, as evidenced in the complementarity of the sexual organs of men and women. So for Augustine, the, the sexual organs are a sign of a unity, the unity of the whole church. The church is united as one body, the body of Christ, just as Adam and Eve are united as one flesh in Genesis 2, prefiguring the mystery of Christ in the church in Ephesians 5. Second, Augustine considers whether after the resurrection, the blessed will see God face to face with their transformed bodies. This is also fascinating. Augustine's wondering whether or not we will physically see God, if the vision of God is in some sense physical. For Augustine, the direct contemplative vision of God is the heart of the attitude. Yet this is a kind of spiritual vision, whereby one clings to God as one's final end and enjoyment. Therefore, we won't see God physically with our visible eyes, but we will see God insofar as we see and recognize truth. The same could be said for our life today. We don't see God physically with our eyes, but we do talk about seeing truth. We do talk about seeing beauty and goodness. And in the same way, we will have a spiritual vision of God. Augustine concludes that a corporeal vision of God is unlikely. Yet, in the final book of City of God, he suggests that just as our eyes now see life in other bodies by looking at them, so too the eyes of the spiritual body will be able to see God in their own way as present in all of the transformed universe, and as the source of life for all creatures. Thus, the blessed will see all of creation in its transfigured and glorified state as evidence of God's glory, and as further reasons to offer praise to God. For Augustine, heaven does not consist of a kind of passive contemplation. Rather, it will consist of an activity all of its own, namely, the activity of praise. The life of the saints is a life of praise without ceasing. Every part of the resurrected body will play its part in praising God. In this resurrected form, the church will be perfected in its angelic fullness and will form one eternal community united in praise. Heaven, therefore, is essentially social and ecclesial, and it consists of a perfectly ordered and harmonious societas of those who enjoy God and who enjoy one another in God. These two aspects of the resurrected body point to the communal nature of the eternal life given by Christ. On several occasions, Augustine speaks of the church as the family, the familia of God, or the family of Christ, gathered from all nations in incorruptible flesh. Just as Noah and his family were marked by water in the wood of the ark, so too the family of Christ, the church, is marked by baptism. Augustine invokes the family as a way to imagine the society of the saints. Yet, his primary way of conceiving of the church is a communal body, the one body of Christ, united in charity. At the eschaton, there will be a final restoration of bodies, just 
and the martyrs will bear the wounds of their suffering, not in deformity, but in glory, just as Christ bears the wounds of his passion in his glorified body. This principle applies to all who come to share in Christ's life and glory. That is, all the members of Christ's body will bear the marks of their suffering as marks of love in their resurrected bodies. These wounds will be transfigured and transformed so as to reveal the depths of love signified by bodily suffering. And the resurrection of the body will be a visible revelation of the depth, height, and breadth of Christ's victory over death. For Augustine, the Church's celebration of the Eucharist anticipates the final eschatological kingdom. Precisely by uniting the heavenly city with the city of God on earth in pilgrimage. At the Eucharistic altar, the Church offers the one sacrifice of Christ, the High Priest, in the form of a servant, in union with the sacrifice of the whole body of Christ. This is the total supreme sacrifice, the totum sacrificium, of the whole Christ, the totus Christus, that leads the members of the body to their final happiness, which is to cling to God as their final end and the source of supreme delight. Citing Romans 12, Augustine asserts that the members are now conformed to Christ the head, and this is the offering by which the church shows that she herself is offering as the sacrifice, pleasing and acceptable to God. The one sacrifice of Christ, the supreme work of mercy, infuses all the sacrifices of the body, that is, all the works of mercy offered by the church in love of God and love of neighbor, making them true sacrifices that affect the union of the one Christ, head and members. In anticipation of the eschaton, the church is united as one body. And it is only then at the eschaton that all the works of mercy, offered as sacrifices out of the twofold love of God and neighbor, will be revealed in the fullness of glory, and in a permanent and eternal fashion, as marks and signs of charity, forever born on the bodies of the saints. Turning now to the Korean martyrs and the Korean saints. The Korean martyr Chong Byuk Chong, whose namesake is Augustine, compiled and edited the first catechism in Korean. This is the Chugyo Ruchi, the Essentials of Catholicism. This work was likely written in the late 1790s, and it relies heavily upon various books in classical Chinese. The catechism was circulated widely and remained in print through the 20th century, and thus it played a significant role in shaping Korean Catholic views of eternal life. In its narrative of the afterlife, the Catechism offers a traditional Orthodox account of death, judgment, and the second coming and general judgment of Christ, based upon the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus' suffering merited not only his own resurrection, but also the promise of a new and glorious life. Yet before the full revelation of his new life, God will bring judgment to the world, preceded by great calamities. Following the judgment, the good will be sent to heaven, or the evil will be sent to hell. According to the Catechism, heaven is a place of immeasurable joys, where the blessed gather together with Jesus as companions and siblings of countless angels and saints. Heaven, therefore, is depicted as a place of family reunion. And this means not only reunion with the members of one's family, from this world, but also a union with all the members of the family of God, that is, the saints and angels. Heavenly joy consists of the vision of God, for the more one sees God, the more one's pleasure increases, whereas, by contrast, hell consists of eternal sufferings. This vision of afterlife, as depicted in the Korean Catholicism, stands squarely within Catholic Orthodoxy. We find in the Korean, Cate uh, Korean Catechism a clear continuity with the Western Catholic tradition on matters of death and eternal life. Yet, there is a pronounced emphasis upon familial reunion. This is evident, for instance, in the letters of Korean martyrs such as Luthgar Yi Son Yi and her brother Paul, uh, who's, and for these siblings, the hope of heaven includes family reunion, and this is what enabled them to persevere in the midst of persecution. It provided comfort for those who had to give up familial duties, such as Paul, who had to ask his older brother to look after his family, while promising that should he be taken to heaven, 
he would help his family to get there. This promise extended not only to his family, but also to other members of the Myeongdohe, the Society for Eliminating Delay. Korean Catholicism, therefore, offers a view of the afterlife that is continuous with the broader Western tradition, particularly in terms of the communal nature of heaven. Yet it places an emphasis upon familial reunion, for being in heaven will to, for, to enter to, for to enter heaven means to become a sibling of the saints. This is the distinctive contribution of Korean Catholicism, namely the transformation of communal relations in familial terms. As we have seen, this idea is not foreign to the thought of Western fathers such as Augustine, yet it is more pronounced in the Korean tradition, and there is an added focus on reunion with one's earthly family in heaven, perhaps due to social and cultural factors. Although there is no explicit mention of familiar reunion in the works of Augustine, Augustine Pippo, this idea is in line with his notion of the Church as the one family of God and the one body of Christ, united in charity. Further, for both Augustine of Hippo and Augustine Chong, the distinction of the members enhances rather than diminishes the union. This is an example, therefore, of how diversity leads to unity. This is the case of Balbal in the examples of the martyrs, who bear the glorified wounds of their suffering and the resurrected bodies. Each member is unique and irreplaceable, taking a particular place in the body of Christ. Following the Korean tradition, each saint will be reunited with his or her family, and these distinctive familial bonds will not be forgotten, but instead will be retained, while at the same time the saint will be joined to the entire community of saints and angels, united as the one family of God. How then might one appropriate the insights of these views of eternal life, as represented by Augustine of Hippo in the West and Augustine Chong in the East? This requires an exercise of, the of the theological imagination, with an eye toward the final judgment and the general resurrection of the body. According to Augustine of Hippo, all the saints will rise again, bearing in their bodies the glorified wounds of love in confirmation to Christ. This is not only a restoration of the physical body, but also a transformation and a transfiguration of creation, a perfect and harmonious ordering of all things in praise of God. The saints and angels will enjoy the vision of God as a communal body, a vision that means a participation in the triune life of love, and a clinging to that good which is our final end and rest. In the midst of this union and charity remains the diversity of creation, and in particular the diversity of bodies among the saints who bear the glorified wounds of their particular experiences and sacrifices. It follows, then, from an Augustinian eschatology that the unique attributes of the physical body will be retained according to harmony and proportion. The diversity of creation will not be eliminated at the resurrection, but instead will be restored and further transformed in order to reveal the glory of the Creator. The martyrs, such as Paul, Yonji, Chung, and companions, will rise again and bear wounds of love in their bodies as witnesses in their particular historical context. These bodies share a story of love and offer a narrative of the triumph of Christ's sacrifice in every era. In this eschatological state, the memory of the martyr's suffering will not be lost, but rather will be on display to lead all to the praise of God. Following the Korean Catholic emphasis upon family reunion, it is entirely consistent to hope that the distinctive familial bonds formed during this earthly life will not be lost for eternity. Instead, these bonds will be remembered and restored, yet reconfigured, such that all come to share in the one family of God. The union and charity of the one body of Christ does not destroy diversity, but rather is predicated upon such diversity so as to create new bonds and forge new bonds of union. This theological exercise of the imagination bears meaning for Korean American Catholics who carry forward the traditions of both East and West in a pluralistic context. In this setting, Korean American Catholics have the opportunity to provide a witness that affirms diversity in particular, yet with the aim of union and charity that can only be achieved by the merits of Christ, the mediator. It is Christ who conquers death and gives life and Christ who incorporates the distinctive members of the Church into his one body while preserving their distinctive identities. The Church's hope in eternal life and the resurrection of the body must be renewed in every generation, and Korean American Catholics have the opportunity to provide a witness of hope as bearers of history and tradition. 
What might this look like? I offer three suggestions of this witness. First, the church's hope in eternal life given by Christ does not undermine or eliminate the significance of this earthly life. This view of eternal life is not to be confused with a pie-in-the-sky theology that, in effect, cheapens the church's journey in history. On the contrary, the promise of heavenly glory in the resurrection of the body elevates the meaning of history and adds an eternal dimension. For all the sacrifices and acts of love offered in this life will be retained and glorified in some way at the resurrection of the body. What we do in this life will be preserved for eternity for the praise and glory of God. Or as I often use movie quotes when I teach my students, so there's a quote from the movie Gladiator where he says, what we do in this life echoes for eternity. So I couldn't help but think of that. <laughs> Our hope, therefore, <coughs> does not devalue this life, but rather gives it greater significance due to our final destiny. This is an important theological consideration for the witness offered by Korean American Catholics in a society that seeks to undermine Christianity as an otherworldly religion. Second, given the emphasis upon familial reunion in the afterlife in Korean Catholicism, Korean American Catholics do well to, receive the, to seek to retain the familial bonds and connections, despite the fragmentary nature of contemporary society as a result of immigration and dispersion. The preservation of familial ties is a witness for the whole church and for global Christianity, which continues to grow in a secular pluralistic world. The growth of Catholicism does not require a rejection of culture and ethnic identity, but rather provides a way to integrate and incorporate particular identities, precisely insofar as they are taken up into the mystery of Christ's unifying love. Distinctive familial and ancestral bonds, therefore, are not destroyed but rather are transformed and reconfigured within the mystical body of Christ, which consists of many members bound together in the love of God and neighbor. Third, though not all are called to physical martyrdom, such as the Korean martyrs, the church's members can offer small acts of love and sacrifice, offered in union with the Eucharistic sacrifice of Christ. I'm reminded of John Paul II, who often spoke of the white martyrdom that we experience today, as distinct from the red martyrdom of the martyrs. At the Eucharistic altar, the sacrifice of the whole Christ, head and members, is offered as one body and one family. The Eucharist is the memorial of Christ's sacrifice, and at the same time, a pledge of the future glory, the glory of the risen Christ. From this liturgical celebration, the members of the church are sent out in order to proclaim the good news and to offer works of mercy. The hope of Christians, therefore, is a Eucharistic hope, yielding love of God and neighbor. Korean American Catholics must remember and carry forward the unique tradition of Augustine Chong and the Korean martyrs, but also remain grounded in the Eucharistic identity of the Church, so as not to live in isolation from the communal body of Christ. Just as Korean American Catholicism honors the past, so we must look to the future when Christ will come in the fullness of glory, a glory beyond our Thank you very much. This is going to be interesting. Uh, as Father Simon kindly pointed out, I'm from England. <laughs> speak funny, he said. <laughs> you might think it's all of you who speak funny. <laughs> um, it's going to be especially interesting because I'm going to read um, the paper written by Dr. Andrew King, who's uh, very Californian. So as I'm reading, you have to imagine it's being spoken by Dr. Andrew Kim, who is a biracial, third-generation Korean American. Um, the introduction to his paper talks about his experiences growing up uh, in America. He has a Korean father and an American mother. Um, in the interests of assimilation, uh, he was shielded from his Korean heritage by both sets of parents. Um, his father didn't want to admit uh, his Korean heritage and wanted his uh, child to be fully American. Uh, his mother didn't know any better, he says. Um, and he didn't know either of his uh, grandparents. He didn't know his maternal grandparents. And uh, his maternal grandparents, disapproving of the union, uh, were not in his life. So he uh, had no um, experience with Korean culture growing up. Um, he grew up uh, in 
uh, Big Bear, the uh, San Bernardino Mountains. And um, his uh, introduction uh, talks about his uh, very powerful conversion to Catholicism, or to Christianity actually, and this leading to the study of theology, and then this leading to his uh, specialization in uh, uh, the works of St. Thomas Aquinas, and in particular the uh, theory of the unification of the moral self, which then led to his uh, rediscovery of his Korean roots uh, after being grown up. So he uh, has relatively recently only uh, looked back and tried to research his heritage and is now fully uh, identifying with uh, uh, Korean American Catholics, but uh, didn't have any of that growing up. So this is his paper on um, <coughs> on the uh, theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. As a child, I'd learned to regard identity through a framework of binary oppositionalism, particularly with respect to my Korean American identity. I'd learned to think that embracing my American identity meant negating my Korean one. I took my Korean and American identity as contrary things that could not be joined in a harmonious whole. Through Aquinas, I learned a way out of this kind of thinking. Perhaps one of the most distinctive features of Thomistic thought is the refusal to rest content with lazy binaries of this kind. For example, different philosophical eras have emphasized either the material or spiritual nature of the human person. Aquinas taught that we are a composite of body and soul. Different theological eras have emphasized grace over against nature or nature over against grace. But Aquinas maintained that grace affects nature. It is these two sets of apparent contraries, body and soul, grace and nature, upon which I shall focus my thoughts in the current section. After having done so, I shall reflect upon how these aspects of Thomistic theology help me work through my Korean American identity. Aquinas understood the soul as the first principle of life in those things which live. He laments that the philosoph philosophers of old did not grasp this, as they wrongly asserted that only bodies were real things, and that what is not corporeal is nothing. Aquinas thought this was a mistake. The human experience cannot be summed up in the activities of organs, neurons, and nerves. We are intellectual beings with the capacity to discern true from false and good from evil. We have a spiritual nature by which we seek to arrive at accurate knowledge of divine things. In our day, the material reduction of the human person has again become fashionable. Powerful forces are at work, constantly telling us that we are nothing more than a collection of atoms that happen to interact in a certain way. Energy and matter in motion is all there is. Our deepest yearnings for God, truth and goodness are put on the same level as a craving for a jelly donut, or its instinct. The human person is shaped by natural selection to have certain appetites and aversions. In such a framework, the spiritual life of man is dismissed as a fanciful illusion that one must simply outgrow. Such a view then teaches us that there is no comfort to be found outside of material things. The refusal to recognize the importance of the spiritual life turns man into a self-serving machine racing through a life of tragic wastage, trudging forward like fodder and trying not to collide with each other. The opposite danger is to depreciate the bodily life of man by adopting a false spiritualism that depreciates the physical world of which God is the author. Though we human beings cannot be reduced to our bodies, neither can we negate the reality of our bodies. In addition to being spiritual beings, we are physical beings. We are embodied. We have instincts and desires and needs. This too is an essential part of the human condition. At the heart of Catholic teachings, we find the doctrine of the Incarnation. In the person of Jesus Christ, God became man in a way that did not negate, but elevated and completed our human nature. There were separatists in the early church who taught that Jesus did not actually possess a physical body, as they saw this as depreciating the divine, as pulling the divine down into the earthly. However, sound doctrine has always held that in the Incarnation, the human is lifted up into a higher synthesis while retaining all that which is essentially and distinctively human. We are not then either body or soul, 
we are a composite body and soul. <coughs> Another set of apparent contraries that Aquinas reconciles are grace and nature. Imagine a man sitting by a pond, repeatedly tossing a small stone up into the air, catching it, and then tossing it up again. Aquinas explained that it is unnatural for the stone to ascend. <coughs> All he meant was that stones do not naturally move upward in the air, nor can they move themselves upward by an internal principle. Therefore, the only way a stone can move upwards is through an external cause, like a man tossing it up into the air. A man has the power to apply force to the stone so as to make it behave in a way that is contrary to its stony nature. Now, there were some theologians who held that the fall basically reduced man to the status of a stone with respect to performing good deeds. We had become so depraved by sin that we could no longer do any good deeds without God taking over our wills, as it were. However, Aquinas recognized that if the only way we did anything good was by God using us as instruments, like a carpenter uses an axe, then no action of ours could ever be blameworthy or praiseworthy. There are two types of error that generally follow from discussions of grace and nature. The first is the one I've just finished describing that regards grace as negating and supplanting our nature such that the divine will supersedes and replaces our human freedom. The other view overemphasizes our human capacity to choose and do good things in a manner that leaves no room for grace to be operative in our lives. Aquinas overcame both errors by holding that grace perfects nature without negating it. Because God is a very powerful moving cause, God is able to transform our natures and draw us to himself without negating our freedom. We freely choose to participate in God's plan for our lives by accepting God's divine help. Even this acceptance of grace is made possible by grace. However, this is accomplished in a manner that does not diminish our own volition in choosing to accept help. If the Holy Spirit used our wills as the carpenter uses an axe, then all human merit would disappear, since the only actions that are meritorious are those that are in some sense up to us. However, this does not prevent the Holy Spirit from moving the soul to a loving action of its own accord, rather than under compulsion. It is this coming together of seeming contraries into a harmonious whole that I was most attracted to in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. At the time, I did not stop and ponder why I found this attractive, or whether it had something to do with the difficulties I faced that in some sense are distinctive of my experience as a Korean American. Reflecting upon it now, I'm inclined to think that these difficulties are something immigrant populations, even third generation immigrants like, my, like me, but probably more so first and second generation immigrants encounter. One extreme response is that of assimilation. This is the response I am more familiar with. It entails leaving behind one's cultural background in order to perceive oneself as fully American. The other extreme is to form a cultural enclave and resist assimilation into the wider culture in which one finds oneself. I think the correct approach dwells somewhere in the middle. The Korean identity and cultural heritage is not a rival to American identity and heritage. Both are, after all, different variants of universal human experiences. Furthermore, all Americans that are not Native Americans, and really even they, descend from immigrants somewhere along the way. Certain people with limited theological imaginations seem capable of only seeing destruction in the creation of something new. They could not comprehend that Jesus, who was and is both fully God and fully man, because they saw only the humanness encroaching upon the divine, or the divine supplanting the human. The mystical synthesis frustrated them and blinded them from God's providential and creative activity in the world. There are those who couldn't appreciate the composite of body and soul that is the human person because they preferred man to be purely physical or purely spiritual. There are those that only respect grace as a repudiation of nature or regard nature as authentic only when separated from divine activity. Finally, there are those who can only see in the coming together of different cultural and ethnic strands the negation of two different cultural identities Instead of, instead of recognizing God's providential bringing together of dissimilar things in order to create something new. Failing to appreciate God's creative activity in the world is failure to appreciate God's providence. And failing to appreciate God's providence leads to ignorance of God. 
And this ignorance is something that I, as a Korean American, was introduced to in my own understanding at an early age. I think a lot of us do this. We learn it from a culture that does not know how to categorize us. In a sense, we are uniquely prone to it. In the fullness of the Catholic tradition, we are invited to a new and richer self-understanding, the coming together into a harmonious whole of our Korean and American selves is not an impossibility, but an opportunity. We are not accidents of time and chance, or even the choices of our parents or our parents' parents. That we should be here with our unique points of view, eccentricities, and experiences is part of God's design. God has a specific purpose for us, aspects of which I shall now consider. The main reason why I felt compelled to negate my Korean heritage was because I wanted to feel like I fully belonged. I wanted the comfort of belonging. This desire can be a dangerous one, as in the pursuit of belonging, we are often all too willing to compromise aspects of our authentic identities. The desire to belong can become an idol. However, this touches upon a theme that is not unique to Korean Americans. Catholics believe that God has created us for more than this world. We are ultimately called, in Aquinas' language, to belong to the Society of the Blessed, or Heavenly Jerusalem. We are citizens of this world, but also of a higher kingdom. This raises the issue of how we are able to be in the world, but not of the world. I have argued previously that to embrace the teachings of the Catholic Church puts one at odds with much of secular society. There arises then a mentality among several Catholics to turn away from much that is distinctive in our identity in order to please modern society. If our theology is too supernatural, we replace it with a more palatable, this-worldly emphasis. If our morality is too absolute, we replace it with a divinely underwritten situation ethics. If our liturgy is too full of adoration, we turn it into a coming together for coffee, donuts, and gossip that happens to be preceded by a mass. In order to belong to this world, and not feel in conflict with it, we shed all that which is prophetic and otherworldly and turn the church into a mere social club or political organization. This is similar to the assimilationist approach that I described earlier. Belonging to the world entails repudiating our Catholic identity. The opposite approach is to retreat from the world and form a little Catholic enclave or holy huddle disconnected from the ordinary lives of people standing in many ways in condemnation over these people. This mentality regards the church as a kind of holy island or fortress. Embracing one's Catholic identity entails repudiating the world. The Korean American experience helps us appreciate the need to eschew both of the approaches I just finished describing. Indeed, as Catholics, we are called to recognize that the church forms a part of the whole human family. It is not that we are either members of the church or members of the human family. We are members of both. And it is in this context and with this understanding that we are to work in partnership with others for the salvation of the individual and the renewal of society. Thus, it is in our belonging in the blessed society informs our belonging in the earthly society. That which is distinctive about our Catholic identity is not something to be suppressed or turned into a weapon of exclusion. Rather, it is something we must marshal in order to communicate with others the saving resources which the Church has received from its founder under the promptings of the Holy Spirit. As Korean American Catholics, we pass through different seasons of belonging. We feel in a powerful way societal forces that seek to conform us into a host of prepackaged identities that conceal the true self and our vocations as Catholics. I think that we experience this both as Korean Americans attempting to embrace the different cultural strands that went into making us, but also as Catholics trying to live by a code that the world often finds unintelligible and unworthy. Thus, let us use our experience as Korean Americans to help remind the Church of her true identity and calling. The Church is called to instill the family spirit among the various and disparate groups that make up humanity. When religion goes bad, it becomes just another source of strife conflict and alienation, but true religion does just the opposite. True religion brings contrary things together into a harmonious whole. True religion reconciles the self to God and neighbor and brings inner peace through the strength of grace. It ends the long war. In sum, 
growing up as a third generation biracial Korean American created in me an intense desire to belong. It came to view aspects of my identity that made me different in a negative light. As a result, I suppressed my Korean self in favor of my American self. One of the reasons that I was drawn to the theology of Thomas Aquinas, though I did not realize it at the time, had to do with the manner in which he was able to conceive of seemingly rival aspects of one's identity as forming a creative synthesis that reflected the wisdom and goodness of an all-powerful God. Our ultimate desire is to belong to the society of this God, and it is only here where a lasting comfort can be found. It is only then that the desire to belong ceases to be an idol. It is the striving after of this belonging that is to inform our belonging to the earthly city. As Korean Americans, we must at some point decide to reconcile the contrary strands of identity within our very persons. We may view this as part of God's plan for our lives. If it is part of God's plan, then it is not without purpose. Let us, therefore, as Korean American Catholics, direct the fruits of our labors and introspection so as to shed additional light upon the Church's vocation to form the human race into a single family, where our differences are not used to foster hatred and petty rivalries, but rather embraced as evidence of God's ongoing presence and creative activity in the world that God has not abandoned, but redeemed through Jesus Christ. For your presentation of uh, Justin's afterlife and uh, Korean American Catholic contributed to a uh, further understanding of our heavenly reward, and for Francis for reading Dr. Andrew Kim's paper, making us sound all the more intellectual with your accent. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation of how uh, our identities are not. Uh, in rivalry with one another, but through our Catholic perspective, we are able to bring some reconciliation to that as well. So at this time, I would like to open it up for some questions, and since it is only Dr. James up front, it's, uh, uh, why don't, and we didn't have as much time last session, so if you have questions that need help from the last session that you want to ask here, as well as the presentation of Dr. James, uh, unfortunately, since Dr. Andrew is not here, it's very hard to respond to questions unless someone would like to try um, to speak on his behalf. Uh, but we just kind of like to open up to questions and, and see what uh, thoughts we have at this time. Uh, my question has to uh, see the emphasis they need. I can't help but to ask these kind of questions. And it may not be a, a fair question for you a little bit, but let me ask anyway and see what you say. Um, uh, I, I really appreciate your presentation to put, put um, us in, in the context of um, sacrifice and how it, uh, what that means in the resurrected body. Uh, and that was just tremendously helpful for me. Um, my question is, um, if, if um, Korean American Catholics today are encouraged to um, carry our wounds, so to speak, so that they, they, if they will be born uh, in heaven, um, uh, would you have any suggestions uh, of um, the kind of sacrifices that we can make uh, generally and in or uh, specifically as Korean American Catholics because of our background and because of our distinctiveness, are there, you know, our distinctive ways to uh, carry on? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. So the question has to do with the nature of sacrifices, as I mentioned, in particular with Augustine's understanding of sacrifice and how we will bear those wounds. And are there any particular ways in which we as Korean American Catholics can offer sacrifices? And how is that distinctive maybe to our identities? It's a wonderful question. It's difficult for me to be specific here because, um, well, I can't speak for everyone, and everyone's different. And I think that's one of the beauties of this teaching is that it is particular to each person. And each person has a role as a member of the body of Christ, and that, uh, that will not 
be erased at the resurrection. So it's simple for me to be specific. I think perhaps maybe I could think of some examples from in my own life. I think about um, I think about ways in which I offer my work, I offer um, sacrifices in terms of maybe things that I've suffered in life. Um, going back to teaching catechesis, that can be a rather sacrificial act. <laughs> and for me, it's important to teach catechesis not only in a community in which I feel very comfortable, but also in communities that I don't feel comfortable. So, for instance, I, I taught catechesis um, at my local church when I was in South Bend doing my PhD, and the local church there was largely Hispanic. So I, my Spanish is not very good, I can understand it, but I really can't speak it, but I wanted to be engaged in that community. And, the, you know, the, the students are mostly interested in the kind of car I drove and what I thought about, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did my best to talk to them and try to engage with them, and I think that meant something to them. I, I don't know what exactly, but, but I hope that it meant something to them. On the other hand, I also teach catechesis sometimes in a Korean community. Um, I teach catechesis right now at my local parish, which is largely upper white middle class community. Um, I, I think it means something to people to see that you are Korean and, and that you're doing something as who you are. I think being who you are is the most important thing there. And at any rate, I, I, I can't be too specific about it, but I, I, those are just, that's just an example in my life of how I try to think about maybe some gifts I can offer. While James, could you say a little bit more about um, uh, what sacrifice means? I mean, we have a tendency to hear that and hear, you know, the old kind of Catholic thing of offer it up, right? You know, if something hurts, it must be good. <laughs> so, uh, you know. We're suffering so that you know God. God likes us to suffer because we can then you know our merits go to something else or something like that. But it seems to me that Augustine has a very different idea of sacrifice. That it's not like giving something up necessarily, but it's kind of uh, the very act. Like when he talks in the uh, chapter ten of the book ten of the City of God about sacrifice, it's, it's just a kind of coming together. And the etymology of it is a kind of making making holy. So could you kind of unpack that a little bit uh, for us? Sure, thank you, Dr. Kellen. So sacrifice, the question is, well, what is the meaning of sacrifice? And sometimes we think about sacrifice only in, in, in perhaps a negative sense or the sense of having to suffer to give something up for it. Well, etymologically speaking, sacrifice, it has a lot of origins. Some say it comes from satcher, which means to make holy. So you can think of a sacrifice as that which makes one holy. And so it's not simply a matter of having to endure something evil or wrong or incorrect or uh, painful, but it's in fact to, to be made holy. And Augustine, in his understanding of sacrifice, I think he links it to Christ, who is the mediator, and it's Christ who's the one who makes all things holy because he's the one who comes from God, and he is the one who offers the sacrifice as the high priest. Uh, in his earlier works, Augustine thinks about the sacrifice purely in terms of the, the internal sacrifice that's offered. Um, sort of the, the offering of the mind that's, that's made. Um, but in his later works, he comes to focus on what I presented today, which is essentially the, the sacrifices of the whole body of Christ, the whole community. And so I think sacrifice can be understood as that which makes one holy and that which leads one to be united with others, essentially, um, when we talk about this in terms of the works of mercy. Because it's the works of mercy that lead us to be united as one body of Christ. And that, Augustine says, is a sacrifice that's pleasing and acceptable to God. And he's using Hosea where it says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And he says, the true meaning of sacrifice is mercy. But we receive that mercy from God. And so if we understand that the sacrifice that means mercy comes from God, then that means to be made holy like God, to be made merciful like God. So the more that we offer works of mercy, the more we are conformed to Christ the head, the more we become godlike. And so the sacrifice would be that which makes you more merciful, more holy, than like. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I thought it was fantastic. Thank you. Um, my question, I think, is going to ask you to speculate a little bit outside of your field. It's not really a patristics question, so if you can read it again. Um, but thinking about this idea of sacrifice, um, 
as a cultural outsider during the Korean American experience, then think about the preferential option for the poor. And if there's if there's some like continuity between the, these three things, um, as folks are thinking about Korean American identity and sacrifice now, speak to the, to the preferential option for the poor. Thank you. So the question has to do with um, this understanding of sacrifice and how it might relate to the preferential option for the poor, especially as Korean American Catholics in a different context as well. Um, Yes, what I, what I love about um, the church's teaching on the preferential option for the poor, if I understand it correctly, especially from Gustavo Gutierrez's writings, uh, it's that the love of the poor doesn't come from ourselves. That is to say, its origin doesn't lie in, in what I do for someone else, but the origin comes from God's love. Um, the, the preferential option for the poor, therefore, isn't about privileging one class over another nor is it predicated on the position of one being higher than another and then thereby showing some sort of love for someone in a different position. It's instead about finding the love that comes from God and God as the source of the love that's shown to the poor. In his book on Job, Gustavo Gutierrez uses this example specifically when he talks about how Job, at the end of the book of Job, he stands there and he's, he's lost everything and he's talking to God, and God shows up and appears, and um, it's sometimes if you read that, it seems as if God is simply saying, I'm much bigger than you, so why don't you bow down before me? It's just sort of a macho contest of showing who's bigger. But <laughs> Gustavo says, if you read the text carefully, and you read what God says to Job, God says, uh, look at the Leviathan, look at all the creation that I've made. I have not made them to use them, but I rejoice in them. And so what we see is that from God's perspective, God doesn't look at the world in a utilitarian fashion. God looks at the world in terms of the goodness from which he has made it completely gratuitously. And the same is true of humanity. We are made out of God's gratuitous love. We're not made in a utilitarian sense. So what Job sees then at the end is he sees from God's perspective. He no longer looks at creation in a utilitarian way. And that's the perspective that we all need to see with. Um, and I think that that's the love for the poor. It's, it's not looking at the poor as a utilitarian way, whether it's because I can serve them and gain something from them or they gain something from me. It's instead to see them as created by God, completely gratuitously, and sharing in that love. I think that's an insight that, that we can carry forward. I think that's an insight that applies to what Augustine is saying, too, because the works of mercy all flow from the mercy of God. How it applies to Korean American Catholics, I think, I mean, that's, that's a, a very good question and something to consider, something that I welcome all of you to consider as well. Um, I don't have any immediate answers for that, but if anyone wants to think about how it is that we look at works of mercy, I would certainly be yeah. I think uh, part of it is what uh, Dr. Andrew Kim was mentioning, is that it's not a rivalry, but it can come together as a composite, and right now, as we stay inward as an enclave, the preferential option for the poor never goes to the other. It's always to our own situation. And I think that's the challenge of the gospel, is to see the other, to move out of our enclaves, our, out of ourselves. And I think that's the place that the next generation is in. Is how do we move out of ourselves and then to start looking at the other? I have a question. Um, you mentioned that the Korean experience uh, highlights the familial bond in, in the heavenly reunion, and that comes from a, a very Confucian uh, uh, society, a family, and so forth. And, and so at some points, that Confucian has negative aspects as well. And, it, it, and is it fair to just take the positive aspects and apply it to heaven and uh, not make comments about the negative aspects of the hierarchy? or uh, uh, certain aspects of shame or other things that are maybe contrary to the gospel uh, call for weakness. So how do we reconcile that? The second part is, in the gospels, we hear that we are neither given in marriage, right? So these kind of bonds disappear in, in our heavenly reunion. And so how, how do we justify one set of bonds being retained, but the others are, dis are disappearing? Thank you, Brother Simon. For the first part of your question, uh, I think at some level, Christianity does like to appropriate aspects of cultures and other thought. And uh, I, 
I think it does have to take into account those negative considerations that you mentioned. But uh, in and of itself, I think family is generally recognized as a good, and as a good that's given a supernatural character in the Christian understanding. I think this is something that's nothing, this is nothing that's entirely new to Christianity. Christianity tends to uh, adopt and appropriate different ideas, uh, not only from the culture, but from philosophy, from obviously things like Platonism, Stoicism, you see this in Augustine as well. So, but uh, it's not a wholesale adoption, so it's, it's not to accept something whole cloth. It takes something and it transfigures it, it re reconfigures it. And I think that might be the way that I would approach uh, that understanding of family. In terms of the, the second part of your question, which has to do with the marriage bonds, I think it's, the scriptures certainly say that we're no longer given in marriage, so marriage as we experience it on earth is, is not the same as it will be. Um, but I don't think that that necessarily implies an erasure of what, of the bonds that were formed in marriage. I think it instead shows what we were all aiming towards, you could say, or what the, what the, un, the end game of that union is. And St. Paul tells us this already in Ephesians when he says, I speak to you of the love of, of Christ and the church, and I, I speak of the union of man and woman, but, but what I'm speaking of ultimately is Christ's love in the church. That's what marriage is a sign of. It's a sign of Christ's love for the church. So when we enter into heaven, which is the heavenly feast of the, of the Lamb, it's the, the, uh, the, the marriage feast of the Lamb with with the church, the Lamb being Christ and his bride, the church, then we are actually entering into a marriage feast. But it's not marriage in a particular fashion that we experience it here. It's the greater marriage, you could say, that all of the marriage belongs to. Any other questions? Bob? I have one back to the previous section, the session. Uh, Father Paul, the uh, it was in your title already about Pentecost, and you made just a passing, passing reference the importance of Pentecost for our sense of Catholicity and so on. Uh, and that, that's a thought that's been around for a while, but, but when you spoke it, what, what struck me is what an opportunity our celebration of the Feast of Pentecost might be for the kind of very diverse church we now have. Do you have any thoughts on that, particularly as a pastor? <clears throat> uh, we celebrate Christmas and, and Easter with such uh, yeah, intense joy and emphasis. And so my quotation has been like, Pentecost should be a uh, why Pentecost is relegated to the uh, 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 Whatever, the importance has, hasn't been uh, underlined enough, and that's why I say it should, it should be quintessentially American feast at all times and always. And especially like Bishop's Conference you know, with the creation of the uh, Secretary for the Cultural Diversity and emphasizing intercultural competence say all that, and uh, parishes are increasingly becoming uh, multicultural, this uh, intentionally intercultural and intentionally Pentecostal, I think is something that we need to take serious, seriously, and with so many foreseeable benefits, it's very Catholic as the uh, Andrew was able to uh, articulate through his own experiences that uh, wonderful and joyful synthesis of the, our uh, Catholic thinking and, and lifestyle. Uh, that's, I, I see all the benefits. So, I guess, uh, that's what I was, I was trying to Emphasize my parish, and I, I told some of the bishops, but they don't listen. That's good. Yes, I know. Uh, Might I offer an observation? Heaven is about crazy. You have to talk about these things if they're going to matter. So if, it, in, if, if the woman is going to be happy with her stretch marks, 
She's in heaven, she's going to have time to talk about the experience of getting them what they meant to her. And everybody will be happy to listen to her story. All the dimensions of our of ourselves. Let's go back to Pentecost. Let's say each of the twelve apostles had a chance to say, what happened to me as I took part in interacting? And the people could tell, I interacted with this apostle in this way, in my language. All this vibrancy of uniqueness, how my culture helped me in, interact with this situation, this per person in this way. I got the insight as I developed. We're developing and growing things. Augustine, unfortunately, just lets us sit there and imagine we're describing some thing that it doesn't go through a history, doesn't it doesn't have an insight that's expressing itself. It's the body all by itself was important. I don't think in heaven it will be important unless it's talked about and elaborated on how a living person is embodied. The, the body was part of the, the whole thing, but the person then going through the experiences in the grace of God, in the light of the Holy Spirit, in the sense of, of, of Jesus being with him at times. I think that that's what heaven, and, and speaking about it, is going to get to. And it, staying, staying and describing these upside questions we can think up of, but I don't think they're the important ones when we really want to come to the dynamic of talking about active heavenly life. I appreciate that. And I, I think that it goes back to what Dr. Kemp spoke about when he said that there isn't a necessary opposition between what the body and the soul do. That is to say, there's no opposition necessarily between what the body evinces and what we speak about. And I think the, the Augustine's point is that the body will in fact give a kind of narrative. But um, like you say, you also need to speak about it. You need to share the story. So it's not an enemy of itself. We can have our access to them. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Um, I don't know how to question you. Um, uh, my question is for um, Father Paul and, and Father Simon. Um, as I'm quite certain that uh, I'm not alone um, in my concern about the future of, um, of our community, um, Korean American Catholic community. Uh, do you, um, how do you see the future of this, this community? Um, in your presentation, I was thinking about a, a non-Catholic uh, Asian Christian scholar who suggests that, um, that eventually this is all going to become sort of intercultural or multicultural, whatever you want to call it, um, communities that uh, we're all eventually going to mix and it's going to be this nice, um, whatever, melting pot salad. Um, is that, do you see our church going in that route eventually or do you see goodness in having, I mean, you use an enclave and, and the ghettoization also, but uh, do you see the goodness of keeping our ethnic identity and having specifically Korean American Catholic ethnic churches uh, intact uh, instead of becoming a multicultural church? Is there goodness in that uh, also, or do you see the final end is this multicultural church? In so I guess um, we've been going through certain models of paradigms, like a melting pot was emphasized and then uh, the mosaic model, so everybody has his or her own place, but just stay there, keep your place, and go about everybody else in a sense. And the, these days, they talk about salad bowl type, so everybody brings some distinct uh, taste, and all mixed together, so no one the happily thereafter. Um, but again, the Pentecostal model is, is, seems to be more theological and, and the desirable in the sense um, in, a, in the church of, the, of Pentecost, everybody maintains and is proud and grateful for the uh, inheritance one has received without negating 
that given identity and experience, you can also enjoy others' company. Uh, having said that, exactly what the future American parish parishes will be like, uh, I'm not uh, a seer, <laughs> but probably in a sense like speaking for God. Um, what the scripture has to say, what the, the vision that Jesus has given us, and what the church uh, has been practicing her Catholicity. Obviously, you know, I am, um, I've gone through the, as an immigrant, have gone through you know, different stages. When I first came, like, I don't know, I wanted to recognize from my own merits then because I didn't want an affirmative action type of approach. And in saying that there's certain pride involved, not necessarily Christian. And my own journey and the, I've been able to observe the, the Korean uh, communities through the organization of the Kappa. Yes, he was president, I was president for a couple of times. And I've seen a lot of uh, tensions and conflicts as well as the uh, uh, joys and achievements. And even now, the uh, Korean American Catholic communities have different uh, patterns, not that they are all the same. Some um, are in an intercultural parish setting, or shared parish setting, or just totally isolated, or just you know, on their own, the canonical parishes, and as well as the uh, just communities within the diocese or pastoral mission. So different patterns um, and models are uh, practiced at the moment. And one of the I had in my previous parish, I sort of started the Korean community, and they they are doing just fine even after I left the parish. So the pastor doesn't speak much Korean, so every once in a while. Student priest comes and celebrate mass for them, which is, uh, of course, they would like to have the Ukraine mass all the time, uh, but they are pretty much uh, happy with the, the arrangements they have. So there's um, and other nat uh, national groups too, like we have an Italian parish in, in the archdiocese. But they have their own, you know, stories and satisfactions and dissatisfactions, you know, as we all do. And, and we have so a lot of Pennsylvania parishes in like the street corner, and Irish, Polish, Slovakian, and you know, Italian parish all coexisting in the, the street corner. Uh, they are all going through some transformation. So I don't have the uh, uh, clear picture of where we are going to go, what we are going to be, but we don't need to give up our uh, identity or heritage. Uh, we can be, hopefully all those good things could contribute to the greater uh, realization of Catholicity, however it, it is realized. So I hope that's good enough for that, sir. Uh, I think more than fearing that we're becoming multicultural or intercultural, I think the, what I fear is the generational issue, and that goes beyond just Korean American Catholics. It's a, after the immigrant groups come, generationally it's hard to sustain a model of church. And one, it's what Bob had mentioned earlier about the transfer of leadership, but the two is you have to have kids to have the next generation, and we're not having enough kids to populate. So what, what we are doing, is it going to survive? And I don't know the answer to that question unless we start making changes. That's what I, I do know is that we have to start changing our view of family. Uh, you know, the focus is not just on a family, but having children in the family. 
um, to populate the next generation. The view is also how to get the next generation to take ownership of the church as well. It's, it's not, you know, if you think about it, our parents came when most of you young adults are here in the audience. And they were able to sacrifice or lay the foundation for the Korean American communities. And if you think, if you know, if you put yourself in that situation and say, can I do that? I think most of us would see that as an impossible task. But we have more resources, we have more skills, and we should be able to do even more, but yet mentally we're held back in some sense. So it's this generational challenge, I think, more than how do the cultures come together. I, you know, whether it's a shared parish model or it's a national church, to me, I think that's not the question. The question is how are we passing it down to the next generation, regardless of our setting. And that is the, um, I think, one thing that we're, we're not, just as Korean Americans is not seeing, but overall in church, in the U.S. church, we're failing to see that model or how to address that question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm so happy to be here and hearing the Korean American uh, Catholic communities, um, you know, developing their theology. Um, this is not a question for me, but uh, I just found something like a uh, missing point. <laughs> Because I think this uh, symposium is not include uh, women's voice. I mean, the, the experience of women might be very uh, peculiar in this uh, Korean American community here. Because the women really, uh, you know, when, when they come here, just support the husband, you know, whatever study or working. So, you know, their voices are not seems included here in this theologizing. So that is, I, I think, uh, my impression, and then I think, and I hope you include the, the women's voice. That's here. the very first sentence of the uh, introduction. That people will notice a lack of, of, of a certain population, the women population. It's not because we intentionally left the women's voice out. Dr. Yang, who's a brilliant scripture scholar at Chicago Theological Seminary, was part from the very beginning of this project, and yet because of personal matters, had to withdraw at the last moment and couldn't complete. So she was with us for two years in the project. Others have been asked and invited, and we just haven't had the response yet. And so that is something that was addressed in our meeting last night when we gathered after our arrival and say, how do we include, how do we reach out to that segment of the population? And not only reaching out, but it's, I think it's also nurturing the, voc uh, the vocation of women theologians for the next generation, not just for those who are coming over from Korea to study, but really second generation, third generation uh, Korean American Catholic women theologians is what we're really lacking as well. And it's not something that we just have can wait, but it's, it's an initiative that we have to take and say, how do we nurture those uh, Things. And so it is a very much on our radar. And it's not intentionally left out, but it just happened that this is the way this ended up after the three year process. Let's get to have one more question before we break for today. Final question for Father Sai. <laughs> so there's, um, you know, the importance of preserving aspects of our culture, as we talked about, obviously our uh, beliefs, our religion, our, our Catholic um, faith, uh, also uh, history of the Korean martyrs. Uh, do you see a value in, uh, you talked about the, um, you know, the mythology of our origins and the, the whole bear and the tiger thing. Where does the, I don't know where that belongs in that whole framework of the, the value of preserving our identity. Is that really something that needs to be preserved? I think because we are not able to paint a complete picture of our stories, those narratives, those stories of uh, methodological origins fill in those gaps. And uh, what they remind us of is that there is a connection for not just myself, uh, but for me to God, for one another, and for the community. 
that it seems to be a common thread throughout. So when we miss, when we don't have those stories, we have to create those stories. And that's not, it's, and it's not unique to us, but as I was trying to show, that's what the Hebrew people did, that's the Korean people did, and so we should have the freedom to create our own history too, as in the best sense as we can. One of the challenges for Korean American Catholics, or just Korean Americans in general, is that when the immigration happened after the post-1965 legislation, our, the first generation never really spoke about why this immigration happened. This, that's what, what I talk about in terms of rupture. It, it ruptures because there wasn't why, parents never told their children, we're doing this because this happened in Korea, or this is what we experienced. Rather, a meta-narrative was used to say, because of poverty or better opportunities, that these were the examples that were given from many families, but they didn't have details. And because we don't have the exact narrative of how we left Korea to come here in the first wave after 1965, that's almost kind of the situation that requires if the first generation doesn't tell us, we have to somehow recreate by going back and um, reflecting on these moments as well. Thank you. Perfect timing. <laughs>